Life-changing moments happen every day in the lives of different people. It may be a near-death experience. It may be a diagnosis that you get from a, a doctor. It could be winning a, an award. It could be meeting someone new. Um, but life-changing experiences happen every day. And whatever might be the cause, uh, a life-changing moment is when an event or something happens in your life that changes the direction of your life forever. It's not just enough to go through a significant event that has no effect on your life. That's not life-changing. That's just having gone through something. But a life-changing event is experiencing something or meeting someone that changes the direction of your life from that moment forward. That's what a life-changing event is. Many of you can think back on your lives to a moment that perhaps or perhaps many moments that have changed or, or shaped the direction of your life. In this morning's passage, the Apostle Paul, as he continues to argue against the idea that a person can be saved through works, and as he encourages the Galatians to remember the greatest life-changing moment in their lives. He has them think back to when they first received the Gospel when they first heard about Jesus Christ. Uh, he takes a rather harsh tone with them as he opens up this chapter. If you have your Bibles, turn open uh, there once again to Galatians chapter 3. And we'll look at the first 14 verses of the chapter. As I said, he begins with what seems to be a rather harsh tone. He says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you before your very eyes? Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law or by believing what you heard? I can, as I, as I was thinking about this passage this week, I, I had in my mind as Paul was dictating this letter to, to the scribe, I, I, and as, as, as he was working through these ideas, I, I got the sense that at this point he'd be starting to get worked up starting to get agitated or uh, passionate about, about the argument that he's trying to make so crystal clear to these Galatians. Uh, the NIV softens it a bit here when he opens up the chapter and he says, you foolish Galatians, the original language, a, a more accurate translation in our day would, uh, would be, you stupid Galatians. Uh, but I don't know, stupid's a bad word in our house. And uh, most of you are probably the same. So they soften it a bit for us, but that's really the tone. Uh, you stupid Galatians, who, who has bewitched you? Paul's completely dumbfounded. He's, complete, he's completely stepping back and, and, and shocked about what's happening in this church. Think about this. Uh, I was thinking about how to illustrate this, uh, why, why Paul would take this tone with them. And, and this illustration came to my mind. Imagine for a moment that you buy your child, your, your son or a daughter, maybe they've turned 16 or 17, or maybe they're in their late 20s, who knows, but you buy them a brand new car, all right? And, and, and it's totally free. It's a gift from you to them. Brand new car. It's, it's everything they could need. You know, it's got the four-wheel drive, uh, the, the for whatever you want, the sunroof, air conditioning, anything, you, anything that the child wants. It has all that you need and all that you want in a vehicle. And they give that to their child freely. And they, and they take the car. They're very happy with the car. They receive the car, of course. And they drive it around for a while. And, you know, after a few months of driving this nice, brand new vehicle that was given to them for free, they decide, you know what, I, I, I'm going to trade this in for an old, rusty K car that I, I, my brother and I, my parents bought us a K car when we were teenagers. It was yellow. It was awesome. Everybody loved that car. Anyway, you, you trade in this brand new, nice vehicle, everything you wanted, and you trade it in for a rusty, old, beat-down K car. It's breaking down all the time. Some of the young people can relate to cars breaking down all the time breaking down all the time. Yeah, that was a joke, you know. Uh, it's, it's breaking down all the time. You never know when you're going to get stranded. And, and, and most of all, you have to pay for it. 
You have to make car payments on this old, rusty car that breaks down all the time. Now, if you're the parent of this child who's traded in the brand new car that you've just bought them that never breaks down, that's perfectly working, and they, tra- and they got it for free, and they traded it in for a rusty old broken down K car that they had to make payments for, what would you call them? You might call them foolish to lessen it a bit, but in your head you're thinking, you stupid kid, right? And that's what Paul is trying to communicate to these people as he's writing to them. It's as if he's saying, I can't believe, I can't believe you would be so foolish. Who has duped you? Who has deceived you in this way? And Paul tells us why he gets, why he's getting so worked up, why this is, why he's using such strong language. He first of all says, Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified to you. You know, this is uh, something that we don't uh, get as much of here in Canada, but if you go for a drive in Detroit sometime, or in in a lot of places in the States, you'll see on the side of the freeways, you'll see giant billboards. Billboards everywhere. Now, now what's the point of a billboard? It's It's to advertise something, right? It's to make a very clear and obvious presentation that gets you right in the... There's no question about what that billboard's trying to... Well, I guess in modern advertising, there is some questions about what they're trying... Anyway, the point of a billboard is supposed to be to make the idea clear, right? Plain as day. And that's the idea here. It's as though the idea of the gospel, Christ being crucified, was, was put up on a billboard for you to see. It was obviously portrayed, he was obviously portrayed, clearly portrayed to you as crucified. So why, why are they being deceived? That's why Paul's getting so worried. How could this have happened? It was so clear to you. And secondly, he points to their reception of the Holy Spirit. I, I, I just want to know one thing from you, Paul says. Uh, how is it that the Holy Spirit came into your life? Did you, did you do a bunch of things? Did you have your grocery list of good works that would make you good enough for God to pour out His Holy Spirit on you before God gave you His Holy Spirit? Is that how you received the Holy Spirit? And they would immediately remember back to that moment. And they would know, no, we didn't do anything. What did we do? We believed the Gospel. And God poured out His Holy Spirit in our lives. They simply believed what they heard. Hearing is very much connected to uh, receiving or believing the gospel. If you turn in your Bibles back a, a few pages to Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, Paul says this, Consequently, faith, that is believing, comes from hearing the message. And the message is heard through the word of Christ. You know, I wonder, I wonder sometimes how many times people uh, sit under the teaching of the gospel, but yet they don't hear it. Uh, these people clearly heard the gospel. It was obvious. And, and they believed. And so they received the Holy Spirit. I, I think what Paul's trying to communicate here is because of their experience, because they heard the gospel, and they believed the gospel, and therefore received the Holy Spirit, they should have known better than to fall for this false teaching of salvation through works. He wants them to know, as he's writing these verses, he wants them to know that they are responsible for what they have heard. They are responsible for what they've heard. And you know, the same thing's true for you and me. God proclaims the truth of His Son, Jesus Christ, in many ways. One way that God portrays the truth of who He is is through what He has, been, what he has made. Another way that God portrays the truth about His Son is through His Word. Another way that He portrays the truth of His Son is through the lives of His followers. And we all who are gathered here this morning, and all people everywhere are responsible for what they have heard. You're responsible when you read the Scriptures. You're responsible for what God is teaching you. When you hear the Scriptures proclaimed, you're responsible for that. You can't go out of here and say, well, 
Well, I, I hope that you can't go out of here. This is my deepest prayer, that you can't go out of here and say, well, well, Pastor Mike never, ever told us. And, and, and so we must understand that we're responsible. Each person is responsible for their response to God's Word. When you hear the Word of God proclaimed and you choose to ignore it, you're responsible for that. When you hear the gospel proclaimed and you choose to reject the Lord Jesus, you're responsible for that. You have to take ownership of what you believe and how you think. There's a trend in our culture that uh, everything is everybody else's fault. You know, I'm not responsible for what I do. But that's not the biblical understanding of, of our accountability before God. We're responsible for what we've heard. And so if we're deceived, if we go and we believe false teaching or false doctrine or we, or we drift from the Lord Jesus, we're responsible for that. You can't go and point the finger at, at other people. And that's not to say that God won't hold false teachers and, and those who try to proclaim lies accountable. He will, absolutely. But at the end of the day, you and I are responsible for what we believe. You and I are responsible for how we respond to the gospel. Paul moves on, and in verses 3 and 5, he writes, Are you so foolish? Again, uh, are you so stupid? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal through human effort? Have you suffered so much for nothing? If it really was for nothing, does God give you His Spirit and work miracles among you because you observe the law or because you believe what you've heard? And there again is that whole idea that the reception of the Spirit comes through believing. Turning one's back on a a salvation by works mentality would not have been easy for these believers when they're first converted. And, And I think the same thing is true today. And I think the reason for that is because the basis of every religion on the face of the planet, with the exception of biblical Christianity, is that you have to earn your way. You have to be good enough. You have to do certain things in order to be accepted into heaven or reach the goal or or salvation or whatever your religious teaching is. See, all other religions are based on human effort, but not Christianity. So turning to Christ would mean then for these people, and it means for many of us today, When you turn to the Lord Jesus for salvation, it means that you turn from the religion of your family and friends. That that is somewhat easier for us in our culture that has become so secular that we're not really turning from much. But in this day, in this context, they would have been turning from the religion of their family and friends. It meant for them no longer participating in the rituals and customs of their culture. It meant for them no longer going down. When, when everybody goes down to the temple the, of the idol to go and, and, and offer their sacrifice and have a barbecue, right? That's what they would often do. Um, unbelievers like to eat as much as believers, and that was what they would do. They would go down to the temple and offer, and they would eat. You didn't go. Uh, maybe you've experienced this in a different light uh, when you've when you became a Christian and you had uh, non-Christian friends who were involved in things that weren't right, you know? Let's go to the party and drink our faces off, right? Maybe that's something that is uh, more pertinent to your life. And you don't go. And you don't go anymore because you've met the Lord Jesus. Well, in, in, in their day and in our day, some people might come back with, what, are you too good enough for us now? You're too good for us now, right? Is that it? They would have suffered uh, the, the separation from their family and friends. They would have probably been ridiculed, and in some cases, in the, Galatian, in the Galatians' case, they would have been persecuted for their faith in Christ. And Paul is saying, you left all of that before. You left the, the, the human thinking of trying to earn salvation through what you do you left all that. You endured all the consequences of being separated from your family and friends, of even enduring, in some cases, persecution. You turned your back on all that and suffered the consequences, and now you're turning back to that same kind of thinking. Sure, it's, 
it's packaged up in a little bit of a different way. There's some Jesus thrown in there. There's some Bible thrown in as well. But really, at the end of the day, when you boil it all down, it's the same kind of thinking that you were trapped in before. Uh, a favorite saying of mine is, it's the same stuff in a different pile. Right? You ever hear that? And that's what they were falling back into. It's like buying that rusty old K car after receiving a brand new vehicle. Right? Think about the work of God in your life, he says. Think about how it came to be. As he says in verse 2, he says again in verse 5, how is it that the Spirit came into your life? Was it not by believing what you heard? Why did God give you the gift of, of the Spirit? Why does he, did He do miracles? Why did He give you all these things? Where did it come from? Well, it came by faith. It came by faith, by believing. And there, right there, you have the most life-changing event that could ever happen in a person's life. They receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, I remember uh, the, the day I became a Christian, and I remember uh, it, was at a, it was at a Christian concert. The, uh, I, I, I've probably shared this before, but I'll, I'll share it again. Uh, it was at a Christian concert of a man named Graham. Uh, his first name was Graham, and his last name, well, not was, he's still alive. His first name is Graham, and his last name is Ma. Graham Ma. I thought that was the greatest name. And that's his real name. It's, it's not like a show name or anything. It's his real name. Uh, and I remember that at the end, he had, he, had, he had done some singing, he had done some preaching, and at the end he said, uh, if you've not received the Lord Jesus for salvation, you need to do that now. And if, you're, and if you want to do that, look me in the eye. And I remember very vividly wanting with every fiber in my being, wanting to look at the ground. I did not want to look this man in the eye, but I was compelled to do so. And there was something that happened to me that day that I will never forget, and it's the indwelling, the arrival of the Holy Spirit in my life. And I've been forever changed since that day. That's the, that's the most life-changing event that can ever happen to any person at any time, anywhere, is the reception of the Holy Spirit by believing the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't often talk about the Holy Spirit in, in Baptist circles. I, I confess that uh, some of the uh, portrayals of the Holy Spirit in different contexts of Christianity kind of make me go, that's, oh, I'm not sure about that. You know, and it causes us to, at times, I think, shy away from talking about the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit, this is what's so critical for you and I to understand. The Holy Spirit is the one who changes us. You see, when you become a Christian and you receive the Holy Spirit, it's, it's Him, it's His power, it's His work that changes your life and makes you and molds you into the image of His dear Son. I just want to consider with you this morning a few things that the Holy Spirit does in the life of believers. I just got to take a quick time out. Is the PowerPoint not available? Yeah, is it? Okay. Uh, uh, so as we work through these, they should, they'll, they'll come up on your screen here. And uh, we're just going to do a little bit of, of flipping. And I just want to consider ten things quickly. This is not the totality of what the Holy Spirit does in our lives. But these are ten important things, some of the important things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives. First of all, turn with me to the Gospel of John. John chapter 16. I tried to, as I was listing these off, I tried to order them or arrange them in a way that would be easy for us to get to as we move through them. So John chapter 16, verse 18. The, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does for us is He shows people their sin. He shows us our sin. Uh, John chapter 16, verse 8. When He comes... Jesus is talking here, and He's talking about the Holy Spirit. When He comes, He will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. He shows people their sin. Uh, that's one of the 
most in our culture, if I had to pick one thing or a few things that would be stumbling blocks to people coming to the Lord Jesus or, or coming to God, it's the idea that they do not know that they're sinners. They do not know that they've offended God. How is it that I know that I've offended God? How is it that I know that I'm a sinner? The Holy Spirit has shown me my sin. He shows people their sin. Secondly, He reveals truth and brings glory to Christ. Look down just a few verses, that same chapter. John chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to Me by taking from what is Mine and making it known to you. How is it that I know that this book, the Bible, is the Word of God? Well, I could take you through uh, a number of apologetic, that is, uh, reasonable uh, reasonable facts for why we should believe the Bible. I could take you through the number of manuscripts. I could take you through the uh, length of period that the Bible was written over, uh, the number of different authors and how it all agrees. I could take you through prophecies and how the Scriptures predicted events hundreds and thousands of years in advance. I could take you through all those things, but ultimately, and all those things are important. I don't want to minimize that. I think as Christians we should know it. But ultimately, I do not believe, when I get right down to the bedrock of it, I don't believe the Scriptures because of all those facts. I believe the Scriptures because the Holy Spirit has told me that this is the Word of God. He teaches me and He leads me into all truth. He shows me how to understand the Scriptures so that I might know the Lord Jesus and ultimately He brings glory to Christ. Do you, in, the heart of, in, the heart of, in, in your heart of hearts, is it your, one of your deepest desires to bring glory to Christ? To magnify His name? To make Him great in this world and in your life? You know, some people say to me, I, you know, I'm not sure the Holy Spirit, you know, I just don't feel it. And, and, and one way, this is an excellent way where you can evaluate, have you actually received the Holy Spirit? It's not necessarily this uh, euphoric experience that, uh, you know, is, is mystical. But just ask yourself a few questions. Do you, are you convicted of sin? Well, if you are, that's the Holy Spirit speaking, to your, speaking into your life. Do you know that this book is the Word of God? The Holy Spirit taught that to you. If you go down to the root of who you are, is it your desire to bring glory to Christ? Where does that desire come from? It comes from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit. If you can say those things, then I could say with confidence about you that the Holy Spirit lives in you. Uh, Third, he, He testifies, I love this one, He testifies in our spirit that we are children of God. Flip over to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verse 16. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Do you know this morning that you're a son or daughter of God? Who taught that to you? Who showed that to you? It's the Holy Spirit. I love the fourth one too. Well, I love them all really. Uh, He helps us in prayer. Go down a few verses. Same chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. If you ever come before the throne of God in prayer, seeking His face, and and just not, you, you just don't have the words. You don't know what to say, how to pour out your heart before God. Well, you know, one of the the most amazing things about the gift of the Holy Spirit is that God knows you better than yourself. And He helps us. And he, He helps us in our prayer life, pouring out our hearts before the Father. Fifth, He directs us in moral purity. Just back a few verses. Romans 8, chapter 5. Romans 8, sorry, Romans chapter 8, verse 5. 
Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. He, he helps us, or He guides us and directs us to moral purity. Uh, sixth, and this is a big one, Sixth, He gives the believer gifts. Flip over a few pages to the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4 through 11. This is also found in, and you should look this up later, Romans chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, Ephesians 4, verse 11, 1 Peter 4, 11. If you want to know what the gifts of the Spirit are, and this is an amazing thing, that when the Spirit lives in us, He gives us things. He gives us gifts. And the purposes of those gifts are to bring glory to Christ. I'll just look at one of these examples. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4-11. through 11. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one, there is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom. To another, the message of knowledge. By means of that same Spirit. To another, faith. By the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing. By that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. Still to another, interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of the one and the same Spirit. And He gives them to each one. As just as he determines. In other places you'll find gifts like hospitality and service. He gives us gifts when we're saved. And, and oftentimes when he saves people, it's not just one gift. Some people get hung up, uh, some Christians get hung up, what's my gift? As though the Spirit only gives one. Well, oftentimes he gives many to individuals so that Jesus might be exalted and glorified. Ask yourself this question if in thinking about whether or not you're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. What's the gift that He has given to me? What's the gift that He has given to me? Am I serving Jesus in the power of the Spirit? Seventh, a unity among believers. Look over in the book of Philippians Chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, verse 27. What happen, whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. The Holy Spirit brings unity among believers in Ephesians chapter 2 verses 17 through 18 Paul tells us that the spirit gives us fellowship with God Ephesians chapter 2 verses 17 through 18 he came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near for through him we both have access to the father by one spirit he gives us, He grants us access, fellowship with God. Before time began, before anything was made, there was perfect fellowship. There was perfect love. There was perfect respect. There was perfect care for one another in the Trinity between the Father, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They shared a perfect relationship. And it is through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit that the believer is invited in, in part, into the fellowship that God partakes in in the Trinity. Not that we become God, but that we have fellowship with Him. That's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Nine, He helps us in our trials uh, over in the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 12, verses 11 and 12. Luke 12 Verses 11 and 12. When you are brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourselves or what you will say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you at that time what you should say. You know, I've often thought about 
maybe I think about it too much, but, uh, you know, being put in prison, being put on trial for the sake of the Lord Jesus. You know, what will you say? You ever have a conversation where you're debating with somebody and you just don't have the words, and then you wake up at three in the morning, and then, that's what I should have said! Well, as Christians, we don't, we don't have to worry about that when we come into those kinds of trials because God has promised us that when we're in those moments, that the Spirit who lives in us will give us the answers. You know, I love hearing stories about uh, people who are on trial or, or people who go through who just extremely difficult circumstances and persecution for the sake of the Lord Jesus, and they come up with things in the moment, that are incredibly profound. You know, I I love when I read through the Gospels and I see Jesus in these kind of situations, and He always has the right answer that nobody can nobody can argue with. You know, and I and I hear about that test those testimonies in the lives of believers when they're on trial or they're in difficult circumstances, and they come up with something I, I I would never have come up with that. Where does that come from? It comes from the Spirit, the Holy Spirit living in us. Finally, He helps us. Ten, He helps us in our boldness for Christ. Oh, how I need this. How I need this. I, I fear oftentimes that in situations that I get into, I, I shy away. I'm not, I'm not able to speak the truth boldly for the sake of the Lord Jesus. But, but, but Paul says to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, Sorry, 2 Timothy, that's critical. 2 Timothy 1, chapter, or chapter 1. I'll get my chapters and verses straightened out eventually. Chapter 1, verse 7. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. He helps us to be bold. He helps us to love those we don't really want to love. He helps us to discipline ourselves when normally we wouldn't. All these things, and there's many more, and we'll, we'll touch on them. Paul talks about them later on in the book of Galatians, and we'll see this again. All these, all these things are gifts from God by the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not from ourselves, and all these things are received by faith. They're not received because we checked off the grocery list of things that we needed to do in order to please God. No, we believe the Gospel and so God grants us, He gives us the amazing gift of the Holy Spirit. Why does He do these things? Why does He give the Spirit to us? He He gives Him to us by faith. By faith, God gives the gift of the Holy Spirit. By faith, God gives the Holy Spirit. Paul goes on and he turns to the example of Abraham. He says, consider Abraham. We're back in Galatians now. Galatians chapter 3, verse 6. Consider Abraham. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who believe are children of Abraham. The Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the Gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. All those who rely on observing the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Paul's point here is that Abraham lived before the law was given. And the closest link between Abraham and the law of Moses was circumcision. In fact, uh, Abraham lived around 450 years before the law of Moses was, was given. The closest link between Abraham and the law was circumcision. And this is what the false teachers would probably have been pointing to. Look, look, just as Abraham was circumcised, so too you need to be circumcised to, to please God. You need, it's not just Jesus. You need to do something as well. Salvation by works. And it's true, God did make a covenant with Abraham through, through circumcision. And that happens in Genesis chapter 17. But Paul takes the opportunity here. You want, to talk, you want to talk about Abraham, let's think about his life for a moment. And he looks to an earlier verse. If you look at Genesis chapter 15, verse 6, 
It says, Abraham believed the Lord and it was credited to him as righteousness. In other words, the reason why Abraham was declared right before God was not because of what he did. It's because of what he believed. He believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. And so the blessing of the nations, of all nations that comes through Abraham, was by and is still by faith. So in contrast to that, the works of the law are a curse. Why? Why does he call the works of the law a curse? Because the law, the Word of God, is bad? No. Because the more you try and justify yourself by works, the more you try and keep the law, the more you realize you can't. It's like a massive weight is placed on your shoulders and you're struggling and you're trying to do everything you can to hold that weight up, but eventually it crushes you. Not because the weight in and of itself is bad, but because you cannot bear the weight by yourself. Uh, One of the great heroes of the faith, the great reformer, Martin Luther, he one day before, when he was in his youth, he was caught in a terrible storm, lightning and thunder, and, and he thought he was going to die. He thought he was going to be killed. And so he cries out to a saint. I, I can't remember the name of the saint. But saint so-and-so, save me! If you save me, I'll become a monk. You know how, you know how people make uh, deals with God, right? When they're, in, when, the, when they're in tight scrapes. God, if you only get me out of this, I promise I'll never do this again. Whatever you're, whatever you're doing wrong, you know. I'll never gamble again or I'll never whatever, you know. And we make deals with God. Well, what typically happens is, is God brings you through the scrape and then you, and then you ignore it, right? But not Martin Luther. Uh, he, he survives the storm and he does become a monk. Now, in his day, there was all kinds of different monks. There was the, there was the easy, happy-go-lucky monks. You know, they, life with them was not too tough. And then there was the hardcore guys. You know, you don't talk for a year. You wear burlap. Uh, you, you fast all the time, like three times a day. And, and all, they're a very rigorous lifestyle. You know, uh, Martin Luther could have easily hung out with the easy dudes. Um, but he doesn't. He goes with the hardcore monks. And as he lives that life, that ascetic life, when he's trying to do all these works to please God, he comes to the conclusion that that the harder he tries, the more he works, the worse he feels. That's the curse of the law. That's the curse of salvation by work. The more you do, the more you realize, oh man, this is just not working for me. And it's a curse. And Martin Luther one day was reading in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 17, which is is an exact quotation of what Paul says here in Galatians 3, 3. The righteous will live by faith. Now it works. And a light bulb went on for Martin Luther. And it totally changed his life. You see, salvation by works is like, it's like you're digging yourself in, in, into a hole. The harder you work, the, the deeper the hole gets, right? And you can't get out of it. Faith, though, brings freedom and blessing, whereas salvation by works is a never-ending curse. Paul talks about this blessing that Abraham has in comparison with the curse of the law. There's marvelous freedom in faith. We must be careful at this point to note that it's just not any kind of faith, but it's faith in a particular person. Look at what Paul writes next, verses 11 through 14. Clearly, no one is justified before the law because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, the man who does these things will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written... Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. He redeemed us in order that we might, in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus, so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Only Jesus, only Jesus, only 
faith in Jesus can take your curse from you. Why? Because he takes the curse upon himself and frees you from it because he himself was not under a curse. See, no one else can do this for you. Because, why? Because all of us are in the same boat. We are all under a curse. Only Jesus was the one who was not under the curse of the law. Why? Because he kept it. The law, the, the law is not a curse for Jesus. That, that weight that was upon Jesus, if you imagine that same illustration, the weight that is upon that is the law that's upon Jesus was not a burden for him. Why? Because he was strong enough to carry the weight. He was strong enough to carry the weight. And he never ever dropped it. He never ever failed at it. And so, it's not just faith in anything, but it's faith in Jesus that brings the Holy Spirit because Jesus became the curse so that we could receive the promise. Jesus claimed the curse that was not his so that those who trust in him can receive a promise they do not deserve. That is the heart of the gospel. And there's nothing else that is so life-changing as the gospel. There's nothing that will, that will set your feet upon a course that is so radically different from the one that you are on other than the power of the gospel. Why? Because with the gospel comes the power of the Holy Spirit. And the question that we need to ask ourselves is do you have or do you know the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? And you think about those ten things, and there's many others. Think about those ten things that we went through this morning. Are those things part of your life? Do you love God and hate sin? Are you using the gifts that He has given you to bring glory to Christ? Are you being changed by His power? I say to you, call out to Christ. Believe what you have heard. Know the power of the Spirit at work in your life. It will change your life. And God gives it freely. God, not it, God gives Him, that is the Holy Spirit, freely to all those who believe. Let us pray. God, I thank You that when we rightly look at our life, when we rightly look at who we are, You make it plain to us that the, the things that are in our life that allow us to serve you, that allow us to live the Christian life, that, that teach us your ways, that teach us your wisdom and your word. All these, none of these things are from ourselves, but all of these things are the gift of the Holy Spirit, which you have given to those who believe. I thank you, God, that you do not give us a task that we cannot accomplish. You don't give us a list that is impossible for us to keep for us to receive the Holy Spirit. But God, you recognize the list. You recognize the requirements that we must meet in order to please you. You recognize our weakness, our inability to do so. And so you have given us, out of your great mercy and grace, the gift of your dear Son, so that through our believing and trusting in His work and His death and His resurrection, we might receive the power of Your Holy Spirit and we might be transformed. God, thank You for not leaving us to ourselves. Thank You for doing this marvelous work in our lives. I pray, O God, that as as the Holy Spirit works in and through us, that the name of Jesus, the name that is above every name, the name that at the end of time every knee shall bow and every tongue confess is Lord to your glory and honor. I thank you for for his work and I pray that you would would continue to pour him out. Make him more, the Holy Spirit, more in our lives and ourselves less for the sake of your dear Son, I pray. Amen.